Good morning. Good morning again to all of you. Can I just say how delighted I am to be here with all of you this summer while Mr. Mark is on a sabbatical. It is truly a gift. And I'm also honored to be able to step in for Reverend Tim while he continues to recover at home. Would you please pray with me? O oh, Holy One, come to us now through your word. And as the psalmist writes, through the sighs that are too deep for words today. And, oh, dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to begin this morning by asking all of you a question. And that is... How are all of you doing? How are you doing? During these past couple of days, I have been thinking about all of you and praying for you and wondering how you have been processing all of the news of the day, especially these last few days. To say that this past week has been overwhelming is an understatement. One of the things that has been especially helpful and grounding for me in these overwhelming and confusing and uncertain times is the inspiration that I find in your long tradition and deep commitment to social justice here at First Church. I would say that it is in your ecclesial DNA, so to speak, and it reaches back at least 140 years and was cultivated and first lived out during those 36 years while Washington Gladden was the pastor here. As you well know, Reverend Gladden and the congregation engaged the wider community in the local social gospel movement, which was rooted in scripture, of course, and inspired by the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And, as scripture tells us, much of Jesus's ministry took place at the margins of society, with and among those who were often overlooked and forgotten and disregarded and dehumanized and seen as the other. Your rich history here at First Church is certainly inspiring, as is your ongoing commitment to social reform and standing with the most marginalized. And all these years later, you are still bold and even prophetic in your witness as you continue to call out the powers that be who seem to have become indifferent to the real struggles of the iniquities and the injustice that exists right here in our neighborhood and in our wider community. Just a few weeks ago, I know that Many of us were feeling especially overwhelmed and powerless in response to all the mass shootings that now seem to occur regularly throughout our society. However, here at First Church, 
led by the youth and Mark Williams. Sixty or so of you marched from here at church to the Capitol building, holding your signs and raising your voices and demanding action and meaningful gun reform in order to keep our children and our families and our neighbors and our communities safe here in Columbus and across our nation. Speaking up and taking action and holding the powers that be accountable is who you are as followers of Christ and as members of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. These times that we are living in today continue to call on us and challenge us as the church to renew and strengthen and embolden our commitment as we continue to seek to co-build the beloved community that the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed about and prayed about and wrote about and preached about. A world in which all people would flourish and thrive. These times that we are living in are indeed challenging. Just this past Thursday, as you all know, even as our nation continues to grieve the recent and devastating loss of life in Buffalo and Uvalde and Laguna Woods and Tulsa, what does the Supreme Court do? In a major expansion of gun rights, the court ruled that Americans now have the right to carry firearms in public for self-defense, a ruling that is likely to result in more people becoming armed. More guns to make us feel safer? I don't think so. However, as you may already know, there was a bit of encouraging news just yesterday when the president signed the first bipartisan gun reform bill in 30 years, which includes incentives for states to pass so-called red flag laws, which intend to remove weapons from those who are deemed a threat to themselves or others. It is a start, but it is certainly not enough. And so, we are called to continue to organize and speak up and take action and pray that this is just the beginning of building safer communities in our city. But of course, that's not all of a, the headline news this past week. There is also the absolutely devastating news of this past Friday, when we all learned what many of us had anticipated and feared, that after 50 years of safe and legal and accessible abortions and re reproductive health care, the Supreme Court has now overturned Roe v. Wade in an historic ruling effective immediately, meaning that abortion rights will be rolled back in nearly half of the states with even more restrictions likely to follow. It has been said several times over during these past few days that the young women in our lives today now have fewer rights 
and their mothers and their grandmothers. And if that's not appalling enough, we also learned the other day that in his written opinion, Justice Thomas is actually encouraging the court to revisit cases that have already been decided related to same-sex marriage and contraception. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, there are no words. I imagine that for you, as it is for me, it is hard to find the words to adequately express the wide range of feelings that I'm sure that many of us are feeling at this time and in this moment of history. Perhaps you're feeling outrage, and anger, disbelief, shock, fear, anxiety, loss and grief, discouragement, and hopelessness. No matter what we are feeling, and no matter how troubled our world is today, what we do know, and what is certain, and what we can trust is the hope that we find in God's word for us today. So then, let us now take a closer look at our text for this morning from Luke chapter 9. In Luke's account of Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus doesn't stay put for very long. He preaches and teaches and heals and performs miracles and ministers to others while on the move, so to speak. And in our text for today, we learn that Jesus' journey through Galilee is now finished, and his face is now set toward Jerusalem, and therefore on the death that he would eventually meet there. And so we sense this shift, not only in direction, but also in the sense of urgency and the change in mood in Jesus' call and in his words when he says to the others, follow me, follow me. In this passage from Luke this morning, we also learn that there were many others who were eager to follow Jesus. But Jesus' instructions to these would-be disciples seem unreasonable and even harsh. And in this pericope, we also learn that following Jesus has to be the number one priority in our lives and in all that we do. For instance, Jesus makes it clear in this story that there is no time to arrange a funeral, not even for a parent. And there is no time to say goodbye to family and friends. And furthermore, Jesus teaches here that anyone whose focus is on the past is not fit for the kingdom of God. And so, Jesus says in this story, follow me, follow me. And Jesus says to us today, follow me, follow me. In these times of urgency, and uncertainty that we are living through, Jesus still says, follow me. 
In our public marches and organized protests, Jesus says, follow me. To the offices of our members of Congress, Jesus says, follow me. To local school board meetings, to advocate for the safety of our students and our children and our teachers and our staff, Jesus says, follow me. To bread meetings, to research and address gun violence within our own community, Jesus says, follow me. And to accompany those who seek access to safe abortion and reproductive health care, Jesus says, follow me. In our text for this morning, Jesus makes it clear that following him is not going to be easy or comfortable or convenient or popular or without sacrifice. But, but, through the gift of community and the gift of this church, First Church, God continues to give us one to another that we would follow Jesus together. As I close this morning, I do want to mention that today is the 65th anniversary of our denomination, the United Church of Christ, which was founded on June 25th, 1957. And I'm sure you'll be hearing more about our anniversary in days to come, but for today, and for this moment. I want to share some words from the Reverend Tracy Blackman, who you may know is our Associate General Minister of Justice and Local Church Ministries at the national setting of the church. She spoke these words this past Friday evening during an online service of gathering and lament called Hope beyond row. Here now, Reverend Blackman's words. We are rooted in something that is greater than this moment. We are rooted in something greater than ourselves. We are rooted in the truth of God's word, the power of God's spirit. We are rooted in the truth that we are all connected and that none of us, none of us are free until all of us are free. Thanks be to God. Amen.